morning. It's good to see you all again this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. I wanted, uh, we're talking today about the gift of confrontation, and as I was thinking about that, I was reminded of a Native American proverb, which says, you can find out what's inside a person because they're like a cup. When you bump into them, whatever's in them spills out. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, maybe when, you've probably noticed that when you're driving, right? And you cut somebody off. Now somebody will be, oh, no problem, no problem, you know. But other people won't be so happy about it. Or maybe you run into somebody in, in, in uh, the store somewhere and you, uh, you know, accidentally bump into them and you get a, like a kind of an attitude. And then other persons are like, oh, no problem, don't worry about it. It was, you know, no big deal. And so, I, you know, we have that reaction. And so, and that's what it is. It's like, we're cups, right? And we're going through life, and we're uh, going through life sometimes fairly rapidly, right? We're rushing around all the time. And what happens when we're rushing around, and what happens in relationships is every once in a while we bump into each other, and, and something comes out, you know, right? In this one, there's a marshmallows, right? And in that, you know, sometimes what comes out is soft and sweet, right? But in this other one are sour grapes, and you don't know what's going to happen. What come, when these come out, you get a lot of sour grapes. You get a kind of complaining and whining and that type of thing. It really depends on what's inside the person as to what comes out, right? The reality is, is that we're probably a combination of both. The reality is that sometimes we're sugary sweet on the top, and we really got sour grapes down in here somewhere, you know. But, you know, our reaction tells us, tells us a lot about what's inside of us. So conflict in a community actually sometimes tells us more about ourselves than it does about other people. How we handle conflict, how we deal with things and sin in our life, it really tells us more about ourselves. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're going and living in Christian community. And this one, you know, he was complaining, he just let out a little wine. So, (laughs) all right. That's all I get. That's all I get for that one. No, you don't have to clap. Don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. All right. So, anyway, we've got these two things. So, community, really about being, when we're in community, conflict happens. I mean, we bump into each other, and it's when we bump into each other that we start to learn about each other and learn about ourselves. And so, really being in community and the gift of confrontation is really can be a gift. Now, I want to think about it that way. Because a lot of times we don't think of confrontation as a gift. We don't think about the way we handle conflict as possibly being a gift to somebody else. But in Bonhoeffer's book on, called Life Together, he says, Christian community is like the Christian sanctification. It is a gift of God which we cannot claim. That it's really that maybe God's sanctifying us in the life of the community. It's when we get into conflict sometimes that we start to maybe are able to point something out in somebody else's life that needs to change, or maybe we see, begin to see something in our lives that need to be changed. And so ultimately that process helps us to become, hopefully helps us to become more and more like Christ. But it only is going to happen if what? If we're open to that. It's only that sanctification process can only happen if we're open to that process happening, to allowing others to speak truth into our lives. But we tend to not do that, right? Right? We, we tend to say things like, well, let's just live and let live. Or we say things like, who am I to judge? Or, well, you know, maybe, maybe if we just wait, <laughs> it'll change. Or, you know, maybe if I, if I don't say anything, maybe they'll figure out on their own. <laughs> and we kind of have this rationalization or justification that we shouldn't ever confront anything or any pain or hurt that's going on in the community or within our lives or in somebody else's life. But you know, confrontation can actually be a very loving thing to do. To go and speak the truth into somebody's life can actually be a very loving thing to do for them and for you. So thinking about that, you know, I came across a proverb, 27, 5 and 6 says this, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. And what the proverb, what the, the wise uh, person is writing there is that wounds from a friend, someone, a friend who loves you enough to tell you the truth can be a very good thing in your life. 
even better than somebody who just tells you what you want to hear all the time. That sometimes a very loving thing to do is to confront the sin or the issue in their lives. You think about that, where's the gift in that? Well, think, think about this a little bit with me. You know, we just saw the Tucson shootings on the news not too long ago. I wonder what it would have, may have happened if Jared Loeffner had had a friend in his life that came to him and said, you know, uh, you're, you're not acting right. There, I see some things going on in your life and I think you need some help. What if somebody had done that in his life? Would the shootings have happened? I don't know. But that would have been a gift to Jared, and that might have been a gift to the community of Tucson if someone had done that. I think of the Virginia Tech shootings and Mr. Cho, who had gone and shot 32, I think it was 32 people. I think about it. Had, what if he had had a friend in his life that had gone to him and sat down in his dorm room and said, you know, I, I've been seeing some things in your life that I just don't feel are good for you or for anybody else. The gift of confrontation may have changed something, may have been a gift to that community or a gift to that person. You see, real friends are willing to speak the truth in love. Real friends are willing to step in there and talk to that person. Bonhoeffer, who wrote that quote I just read, he was actually one of the few who stood up against Hitler who confronted Hitler and said, Hitler, what you're doing is wrong. And there's in the danger and the risk in confront, confrontation is because he ended up in a prison camp and he died because he confronted it. So it can go either way, can it? You know, that's the danger, of that's the risk in confrontation is that sometimes when we go and we bump into that person, sometimes what they don't, not only do they have sour grapes in there, but sometimes there's acid in there and we bump into it and we get burnt. And then what do we learn to do about that part? We learn to avoid them all the time. And then we isolate them because of that. And that's it. therein is the kind of the catch-22, isn't it? Because <laughs> then when I'm full of acid, I tend to alienate people from me and not have any friends that will speak into my life. <laughs> and so I've got to also do something about that. I've got to take responsibility for that. So Jesus actually lays out in the Gospel of Matthew uh, four steps to deal with sin or to confront people or faults in people's lives and lays out four steps. The first step is to go to that person alone and, and, and confront them and talk to them. And then if that doesn't work, the next step is to go and take two or three others. And then sometimes we think that means, well, I got to go get two or three people on my side <laughs> and go confront them. But that's not what that necessarily means. It means we go and get two or three objective witnesses to come and sit with us during this confrontation because maybe there's something that we're missing. So we need somebody else in the room to help us discover what's going on. Maybe we're at fault. Maybe they're not at fault. Maybe it's a miscommunication or a misunderstanding. And so having some other people in the room can help us identify that. But if still that person is stubborn and resistant, we're to then to take it to the church. And if that person refuses to listen to the church, Jesus lays out the fourth step, which is to treat them like a tax collector. And basically it means you kick them out. You send them on their way. Now, just before you think that's it, there's a reason why we read verses 12, 13, and 14. Because just before Jesus says that, he tells the parable of the lost sheep. <laughs> and what is Jesus saying? If somebody's a tax collector or a sinner, <laughs> you treat them like a lost sheep. You go and you find them and you seek them out and you bring them back home. And so you see there's a pattern here. Jesus is really pointing us right back. Okay, yeah, treat them like a tax collector and a sinner. But what does that mean for us as Christians? That means now they're a lost sheep. And we're still seeking to restore them. And that's the point of confrontation. The point of confrontation is always about restoration and reconciliation. It's not just about me getting stuff off my chest. It's not about me being right. It's not about me getting even. Confrontation is really about restoration and reconciliation. So I want to look at, I don't want to, I'm not going to unpack all the steps this morning. I just want to unpack one step. And I think it's the most neglected step in the process, and it's step one. Step one says, you go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. You go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. 
That's the first step. I would say it's also the most neglected step in the process. Because first of all, it starts with who? Who's supposed to go? The other person, somebody else, who's who's supposed to go? You can say it out loud. It's okay to speak out loud here. You, me, we're the ones. (laughs) So it starts with us first. And so we've got to assess, you know, is this something that needs to be dealt with? Is this about me? Is this about the other person? Is it a combination of two? Is this a, um, you know, is this just a frustration I have or maybe a disagreement or my need to be right? Or is this really about addressing something hurtful in another person's life? Maybe it's hurting me. Maybe it's hurting other people and I need to address it. So it's determining that. You know, sometimes it's just about, sometimes it's just about miscommunication or misunderstanding. You know, for example, I come home late at night, uh, you know, a night during the week, and I've been at the office all day and meetings all day, and I didn't get home for, for dinner, and, I, and then I'm at a late meeting, and I get home late, you know, after 10 o'clock at night, and I come in the door, and my wife says to me, uh, can you take out the dog? Or can you take out the garbage? Or, or can you take out the dog and the garbage, you know, depending on what night it is, right? And I can think to myself, you know, my wife is a great, I got a wonderful wife, and I love my wife, and if that's what's going to make her happy, I'll be happy to do that. And so I say to my wife, you know what, sure, no problem, I'll take care of it. And so I go and do that, right? And occasionally that does happen, I want to say that. (laughs) But let's say another night comes around. And I've had the same day, but maybe the meeting didn't go as well as I wanted it to go, and maybe the emails were a little bit more heated than I wanted them to be that day, and maybe a couple people have kind of been on a little bit irritable as well, and so I come home late at night, a little after 10 o'clock, and I walk in the door, and my wife says, hey, can you take out the dog? Can you take out the trash? Or, or maybe can you take out both? And I think to myself, well, what has she been doing all day? What have the kids been doing? They've probably been sitting around watching TV all night, you know? Whose idea was it to get this dog anyway? It wasn't my idea. (laughs) I took the trash out last week. (laughs) And all of a sudden, my reaction is totally different, isn't it? And so my answer to my wife at that point is, sure, no problem. (laughs) See, I've been married for 20 years, and I've learned, right? You don't... (laughs) You don't mess, you know, with that, right? You, you know, you just, the same answer, regardless of what's going on inside of you, right? And so that's part of it is, is that sometimes it had nothing to do with my wife, did it? Same question, same request, different reaction, different response within me. Has a lot to do with me, not with her. Has a lot to do with what's going on inside of me, not with her. And so I've got to figure out, is what's going on about me, Or is it really about something that that other person is doing? Is it just a simple disagreement that I've got to continue to work through and communicate about? Or is it something that really is hurtful to the relationship or hurtful to other people? Those are the things that we need to confront. Those are the things that we need to address. So notice first, so it starts with us figuring out what's going on with us and whether or not it needs to be addressed. And then the second step in the first the second step in the first step, or the second part of the first step is this. It says go. Jesus says go. It doesn't say wait. Wait for it to get fixed on its own. It doesn't say wait until they come to you, because basically that's what we typically do, don't we? We typically say, all right, well, I'm not going to go to them. They need to come to me. They're the ones that got to fix it. It's not my problem. It's their problem. And so we think, well, well I'm just going to wait for them to figure out. Or we offer up what we call the silent treatment, which is a way of saying, I'm not happy with you, but I'm not really going to talk to you about it, which is also another way of trying to get even with the person, you know, or show anger, express anger in a very subtle way. And really what we end up doing is avoiding the problem or not addressing the problem or not even attempting to do anything about the problem. And so, or we can also tend to make excuses for the problem and say, well, you know, maybe they'll figure it out, or, you know, maybe they just had a bad day, you know, and so we start to make excuses for the other person as well, 
And so there are different ways that we can do that. Or we may end up just stuffing it. You know, I don't, have you ever done that? You know, somebody does something and, it, and it's hurtful, and so you, so instead of dealing with it, you just stuff it. You know, just hang on to it. And then you let it get seated down inside of you, and it becomes resentment. And that also hurts the relationship. But who's responsible for stuffing it? Is it the other person? No, it's, it's my, I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for not dealing with it. Because that's what Jesus is saying. Go. Don't avoid it. Go. Don't just stuff it. Go. Because Jesus knows that it will build up and become bitterness and resentment if it's not dealt with. And it can become hurtful for us. So, and another part is, I think whenever we do go to somebody, I think it's always helpful for us to own our part in whatever's going on. See, a lot of times we go into confrontation or conflict and we want to address what the other person is doing or we want to blame the other person. When in reality, sometimes I think it's helpful for us to say, okay, what am I doing to contribute to this? Am I doing anything to contribute to this? Am I doing anything that is enabling this person's sin or hurt or pain in their lives? So that's another thing to be thinking about. And so you can start to see that confrontation is actually very complicated, isn't it? It's not as simple as three easy steps. <laughs> it's a rather complicated issue. So it's about us, and it's about us going. And then it's interesting that Jesus says, it's about you and the other person alone. It's about confrontation that happens alone, just between the two of you. Now, here's where I think we neglect it the most. Because in our own humanness, what do we do? Who do we go to when there's a problem? Do we go to the person? No. <laughs> Why would we do that? We go to the water cooler at the office or the coffee maker or the parking lot at church. <laughs> and then we talk to other people about it. Because what are we doing? We're trying to get validation from other people. We're trying to get other people on our side. We're trying to line up the battle lines, you know, to, to go into battle. So, cause then and now it's a, because, but when we do that, what's it about? It's about winning. <laughs> it's not about love anymore. It's not about helping the relationship. It's not about helping the community. It's about me winning my point. It's about me winning the battle. It's about me being right and the other person being wrong. But what happens when we go to a person and confront them alone? What happens is, is that pride is a little bit lower in that circumstance with that other person. See, the problem is when we tell a bunch of other people, what do, we raise the stakes. We raise the pride level of the other person. And so the willingness and the openness to accept what we may have to say, as true as it may be, is diminished because of the other person's pride has now been hurt. And they become defensive, and they get set in their ways. And so because we haven't gone alone, because we haven't confronted it in private, we have just cut ourselves off from the possibility of restoration and healing and a gift to the person or to the community. So going alone is very important to the restoration process. Whenever we drag others into it, we're really hindering that process Here's a rule of thumb that I try and live by, and that is this. Am I, would I, am I saying something to someone else that I wouldn't say about a person that was standing right in front of me? Does that make sense? That I shouldn't talk about somebody else to someone else if I wouldn't say the same exact words as though they were there themselves. But a lot of times we don't do that. We say things about other people when they're not around, and we all do that. And then in that, we, we diminish the possibility of reconciliation and restoration in their lives. We tend to avoid. So, what would be different if we did that in our relationships? What, do, what would be different if we went to people alone and talked to them privately when we have identified things that we knew were either hurts in our relationship or ways that that person was hurting somebody else. What would be the benefit of that? There'd be a lot of benefits to that. The Bible calls it speaking the truth in love. That really the main purpose behind it is love. That it's not about winning or getting even. 
In fact, the gift of confrontation is actually the first part of the gift of forgiveness. And so I hope you'll come back next week or hear next week's message online because really confrontation is a part of forgiveness. It it can't be isolated apart from the two. And we're going to talk more about what it looks like to forgive next week, but confrontation is actually the first step towards forgiveness. Because at some point we need to say, this is hurting me, or this is hurting someone else when you do this, and we need to address it. To speak the truth in love is a very valuable gift in a community and in a relationship. It's when we withdraw that gift that we actually hurt the other person, and we actually diminish the community when we do that. Bonhoeffer said this also. He said, the practice of discipline in the community of faith begins with friends who are close to one another, words of admonition and reproach must be risked. But would you rather hear that confrontation from somebody you don't know or somebody who loves you? I'd much rather hear it from somebody I knew loved me. (laughs) So it's it's the people, we need people, we need friends, we need people who will love us no matter what. We need people who will love us unconditionally enough to say, this is going on in your life. You, you can't keep doing this. This is wrong. It's hurting me. It's hurting other people. I need to love you enough to say to you, this is wrong. This is not right. You see, we, we tend not to do that because we think it's judgmental. <laughs> we think it's judgmentalism. And Jesus warns us not to be judgmental. And that's not the point, though, is it? There are times, though, when we judgmentalism is about devaluing another person because of their behavior. But we are to be wise enough to say that certain behaviors are harmful. To judge a behavior as harmful is actually a loving thing to do and a wise thing to do. It's not judgmentalism as long as love is the motive. You know, when I uh, first uh, started training, uh, athletic training, I hired a personal trainer and uh, so the first session with the personal trainer is they, they assess you. This is, this is not a fun process, let me tell you. And, and they take you and they say, you know, say they do some assessment about where you're at physically. And part of that assessment is getting on the scale, right? So you have to get on the scale at the gym and they weigh you. And, and, and I liked it because my personal trainer was real easy with me and he said, Well, you know, and he looked at the the total, you know, the number, and he said, well, you know, did you have breakfast this morning? Oh, yeah, well, that take two pounds off for that. And Well, oh, and you're wearing heavy clothes today. Here, take another couple pounds off of that. I said, oh, this is great. You know, this is going wonderful. I like this guy, right? Because he's really soft-selling it to me, right? Then he says, well, come over here. we got to come over here where it's private. And uh, he takes out this, like, little kit, opens it up, and it's got these calipers in it. And uh, I said, so, you know, what are you going to do with that? He says, we're going to measure your body fat. And he takes out these calipers, and so he, but we had to go somewhere alone to do this. Because one, we don't want everybody else hearing about Matt's body fat, that's one thing. But also because he had to start to measure parts of my body that I had never been measured before. So he's taken stuff back here behind my arm and he's measuring that and he's taking stuff in my chest and he's measuring that and he's taking stuff back here and he's measuring that and he's measuring over here and he's measuring around here and he takes all these measurements and that's a very uh, (laughs) disconcerting thing to have and I'm sitting here thinking I'm paying this guy to do this I'm paying this guy to tell me the truth and you know he told me the truth And I paid him to tell me the truth. But it's in knowing the truth that then I could begin to know, build a plan to say, this is how I'm going to change. This is what I'm going to do about the truth. But if nobody ever comes along and says this is the truth to us, because we don't see it ourselves, right? Sometimes. If somebody doesn't love us enough to come alongside and say this is the truth, we can't change. And that's the gift of confrontation in a community.